Hello there. Welcome to Just the Dis. We talk about Blu-rays here. My name's Brian. And um, let me tell you folks, Imprint Films is having one heck of a 2022. They are doing some really neat work. I've already talked about the Wicker Man set, wonderful three-disc set, the penultimate release of that film. Uh, and their recent Warriors set, which is, you know, to date the best release of that movie, including the theatrical cut. You can go back and watch that review. But they are far from done, folks. Far from done. And those are two of my favorite releases of the year. And then this arrives. After Dark, Neo-Noir Cinema Collection 1, obviously implying... Hopefully, we'll get another round of these. And based on this one, wow. This is just an incredible set. Let me just show you the size of this thing to start, okay? Just huge. Okay, and it's, you know, you open it up. You got the nice uh, imprint box. And inside you get like six full discs, okay? And a book, and it's it's amazing. Uh, it's got some real, I mean, there's a lot of gems in here. There's, there's at least one or two that I know folks have been wanting for a really long time. And I know some folks are asking, you know, is it, are they gonna break this down? Uh, you know, basically the idea of wanting just like one or two movies in here. I'm here to tell you that for the most part, this set is really, really solid. Let's start with what a lot of folks are, you know, excited about. And that's One False Move. Carl Franklin's film from 1992. Part of this like indie boom that was happening around that time. Uh... Carl Franklin, this is not his debut film. He'd done some work with Roger Corman prior to this, but he got hold of a script uh, co-written by Billy Bob Thornton, who would, of course, star in the film as an early role for him. Uh, and it is just an incredible... You know, neo-noir, obviously, is what this box set is about, but if you if you listen to Carl Franklin, like he wasn't necessarily making a noir at least at the time, but it's an incredible script and story that starts as one thing and becomes something else. It starts as sort of a crime thriller, opens with um, some grisly attacks in Los Angeles. Billy Bob and his partner, played by Michael Beach, um, find their way into a drug dealer's home, they rob the drug dealer, they kill a bunch of people and flee the city. And they get the LA police on them because of a witness. The uh, cops get word that they might be heading back to a small town, I believe in Arkansas, if I'm remembering right. Maybe that's where they filmed, I can't remember if it's where it takes place. Anyway, it's Southern Town, sheriffed by uh, an ambitious guy, played in an incredible, rare leading man role by Bill Paxton. He's just, I mean, he's just fantastic in this movie. Just very naive, uh, casually racist or more, um, aspires to be an L.A. cop, and when the cops reach out from L.A. to tell him, we might need your help, these guys might be coming your way, he jumps at the chance and is just all about it. Um, but I won't go too far into this, but basically it, it starts there. And so we have L.A. cops coming out to this small town to try and wait for these bad guys to show up. And it turns and becomes much more of a character piece. And I can't think of too many films that can pull that off. 
honestly, and it does it in just incredibly well. It's so well put together by Carl Franklin and well acted. It's just you watch the movie and you get why Carl Franklin totally established himself after this film. And this is a film that was shelved and had to be uh, shopped around by Carl Franklin's agent to a bunch of film festivals, finally getting it in front of like Roger Ebert and ultimately, you know, finding its footing with the critics and then, you know, taking off. But it's the kind of movie that you watch and you go, oh, this is the other movie from 1992. Obviously not the only other movie from 92, like Reservoir Dogs, that really got people's attention in a different way and, sh- and sh- shows violence in a very different way. I remember Carl Franklin talking in a documentary that I love about the filmmaking he and what he was trying to do. And he was like, I want to show uh, the loss of humanity. I want to show somebody that had a life they had hopes they had dreams is not there anymore that's what i wanted to depict and he does that and the the murder scenes in this film they're incredibly sort of brutal but like uh unflinching and so it's a totally different kind of thing and it really just sets the stakes in a certain way and yeah, it's just such a great movie, guys. I know this is one that I saw some people saying, I want one false move only. I get it. Okay, I get it. It's great. Uh, but there's other good stuff here, too. And I'm going to get to that. But yeah, Billy Bob is amazing in this film. Um, it's got some wonderful features. It has the commentary with Carl Franklin, I think from the DVD. Um, he's so sharp, so thoughtful in terms of the filmmaking And equally so thorough in his comments on the film. He talks about character stuff, locations, writing, how it goes from a genre to character piece in the writing. Tells a story of how the film was shelved and all that. You know, how it found its audience. Um, Yeah, it's, it's really great. So then after that we have a second commentary by director Shaka King and producer Brandon Harris. Uh, they are podcasters from a show called I'd Watch That. So that's sort of like a podcast commentary. Interesting. Um, then we have Feeding the Soul, an interview with Michael Beach, who plays Pluto, who's a sociopath in this film. He's Billy Bob's partner. Great performance. Just dead, serious, scary. Um, but a really lighthearted guy. Like a great 16-minute interview with him, talking about his uh, finding his way into acting and all that. Finding My Voice, an interview with Cinda Williams, who plays uh, Fantasia. That's Billy Bob's girlfriend, um, who's along for the ride with these two and really propels the story in this very interesting way. And it's really neat to hear, you know, her story about, you know, getting into theater act, I mean, movie acting. She had started Mo Better Blues in 1990 before this, which sort of opened a door for her to audition for this movie. And she's outstanding in the film uh truth and rhythm an interview with uh editor carol uh kravitz uh canyon canyon about 12 and a half minutes uh the cinder williams is 15 minutes um she talks about a lot of cool things um just general thoughts on directors less coverage the more the director knows what he wants the better the film is uh, she talks about Chinatown being a favorite and I think an influence on this. And she said this is a film that's definitely about the way it's edited, the cross-cutting between the bad guys and the two camps of cops that make it work so well. So it's really nice to hear about her talk about pr- her process with Carl Franklin because this is definitely a movie that's about the structure and the and the editing is just outstanding. It really isn't as good a movie without that. And then there's a Chris O'Neill video essay. I've talked about Chris O'Neill on the channel a lot before. Narrated by Claire Loy, a female voice that I think he usually uses. Uh, Opens with a bit talking about neo-noir and how, you know, One False Move is one of the best. And then sort of proceeds to sort of go through the plot of the movie with some observations, which is what he usually does. Um, And it's, uh, you know, it's it's good. Um, So that's One False Move. Great start. Then we have After Dark, My Sweet. This is from 1990. This is directed by the great James Foley, a.k.a. Jamie Foley. Seems to want to be called that. Um, He would go on to do, uh, well, he'd already done 
uh, at close range, which is outstanding. I've talked about the imprint Blu-ray of that on the channel before. Um, and then he would, of course, do Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Um, and he's just one of those directors that really is a craftsman. Like, for me, he's like, I don't want to oversell it, but almost Kubrickian in his abilities as a filmmaker and his vision, you know? Um, anyway, so this is a great film noir. Almost straight noir. I mean, it's 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 a neo-noir because it's soleil. Like, he talks about uh, a critic, I think, calling it film soleil, you know, noir in sunlight and daytime. Um, it's based on a Jim Thompson novel. And, of course, Jim Thompson worked with Kubrick in terms of he did dialogue for the killing and then also worked with him on Paths of Glory uh, and is just one of the great hard-boiled crime fiction writers of all time. And this is just a really great example of that. This story is kind of of a mentally ill man or a mental escape mental patient kind of, <laughs> an ex-boxer. And we see his history, and he's played incredibly well by Jason Patrick. Um, he comes to this town in Palm Springs and gets roped into sort of a kidnapping scheme. But it's a really interesting performance. Like, he's really made a lot of choices and plays it. He just really commits. And it's, you know, one of his best performances. And what's interesting is that then this movie plays into another movie in this set. And that the producers and the director of that movie saw this movie. And that's how he got it. And you can kind of see in this how he would have got something else out of it. But it's him and Rachel Ward. She's sort of the femme fatale. And then Bruce Dern uh, is sort of her... They're sort of um, in cahoots, if you will. And Bruce Dern is always great. And he's fantastic in this. But I'd really underrated this movie. This is a movie like I think I'd... I'd like. I was like, oh, I've seen that. Didn't remember the whole thing. So seeing it now... Uh, in you know, James Foley, Jamie Foley likes to shoot in two, three, five widescreen. Looks great. Um, yeah, really, really dug this. Really, one of the gems in the set for sure. Absolutely worth your time. Um, so it has an audio commentary with James Foley, which is great. Uh, that is, um, that is uh, moderated by Jillian Horvat. Uh, I think I'm saying that right. Um, and uh, she does a great job. She does almost an even better job on a later release, but she does a wonderful job here because it just becomes a conversation. And she has really done her research, and she's very engaging with the filmmaker, calling out things maybe he hadn't thought of, responding to things he says, really staying on her feet in the moment with him and he responds to it and you can tell it becomes a really interesting conversation he starts by telling some stories we've heard if you watch the light on a film I think it's called uh, light on a film noir the interview that's an older interview I think from another release that's about 20 20 32 minutes and that's a great interview too by the way um, but he, re he reiterates a little bit of that stuff at the beginning of the commentary and then she sort of steers him into some other places and it's it's great um, and I love one of the things he says in Light on a Film Noir. He's like, you want to know who I am? Watch this movie or watch that movie. Meaning that he really saw something in that this character, this boxer um, this that Jason Patrick plays that really he really responded to. And um, I think it's just one of his only writing credits. He, he rewrote the script. And anyway, um, it, it's funny because he has a certain story about casting Jason Patrick, seeing an ad for this movie, The Beast, that he did with um, Kevin Reynolds in the LA Times or something, and then checking out uh, some movie that he was in. I, I can't remember what it was, uh, but then it becomes a thing where once he met with him, he was like, I won't make the movie without him. But what's interesting is there's a couple different interviews. Obviously, it's the same interview, but uh, he talks to a couple different, there a couple different times Jason Patrick uh, is interviewed, or he's used, sections are used in different discs. So this one's called Primal Precipice, and it's an interview with him about 17 and a half minutes. And it's really cool because it's, it's almost, it's of a piece with the next interview. And I'll talk about it in a second. It's about 
he him talking about getting into acting and all the pressure he put on himself to pull off this particular role. Like he saw something, an opportunity in it, and he committed, like I said, to it. Um, his dad, of course, is Jason Miller of The Exorcist. And he just said, he talks a little bit about his family and coming into the business the way he did, like through sort of a burst of fame. He's like, we were poor, but then my dad made The Exorcist and he wrote this play, cha- that championship season, and they made that into a movie and we moved into a better house. And he sort of, so he talks about, it's not like people think kind of, you know? Um, and he clearly has an interesting tumultuous relationship with his dad, which is touched on later in a Bruce Dern interview, which I kind of love how the interviews in this disc talk to each other in a way. Um, like I said, and he goes into specifics about how he found the novel. He found James and got it to James Foley. And then James Foley had him as an integral part of the casting, had him read with all these people. It's really interesting to hear his side of it because Either James Foley doesn't remember it, it exactly, or he remembers it differently, but he doesn't seem to give Patrick as much credit in his interviews. Anyway, this is all stuff I'm taking away from you. You should watch these interviews and just look at how they talk to each other, okay? It's really interesting interesting stuff. He talks about meeting Bruce Stern as a PA on that championship season, getting to know him, having him having sort of fatherly relationship with him, recommending him for this movie, and, uh, you know then it kind of goes from there and just how much he liked the book. Uh, Yeah. Just this idea that this guy, Kali is the main character and he's like in every frame of the movie, basically it's very subjective. It's from his point of view. So a lot of what Patrick is doing is dealing with that. Um, That's from the company that made drugstore cowboy. And I think that's an interesting parallel too, by the way. Um, Then there's the Bruce Stern interview. That's about 13 minutes. He talks about his relationship with Jason Patrick and Jason's dad and how he felt like some of the feelings that they had personally like fed into the movie. And he also mentioned something interesting about the grifters opening. Uh, Obviously that's written based on Jim Thompson too, I believe. And it opened across the street. Basically he thinks the same day that after dark, my sweet opened and he said it killed him. He said it just destroyed uh, it was by far the more well-known movie. This is a relatively forgotten movie, I think, unfortunately. Um, uh, and then there's an interview with Jim Thompson biographer Robert Polito, 14 minutes, and he gives a great context for Jim Thompson in general. Oh, and of course, there's also an audio commentary by film critic Travis Woods, a uh, bright wall, dark room. Uh, I would say a friend of mine, the guy that I know and the guy that I like very much. I like his writing. He did a podcast called Increment Vice all about uh, Inherent Vice, one scene at a time. Uh, And he loves Jim Thompson. And this is one of the first commentaries I've heard from him. I think he's done others, but uh, he does a wonderful job of really, he's very, very excited about it. And he's obviously really written out his thoughts about Jim Thompson, but he's also kind of giving a running commentary at the same time. So it's a really fun hang to, as I expected it would be because Travis knows what he's talking about. So great commentary there. Uh, really nice disc overall. Um, really like this one. Then feeding off of that, we have rush. This is from 1991. This is about two undercover cops uh, and they're played by Jason Patrick and Jennifer Jason Lee and how they kind of get in over their heads in terms of the drug use, in terms of, you know, their relationship with each other. And it's a very dark movie. And it's a movie that I hadn't seen for a long time because I always remembered it being really depressing. And it kind of is, but it's also pretty great. Um, the Pat- Jason Patrick performance I've always had heard was one of his best and it is I mean he's just he's a great actor I really got to give it to him Um, and this is where the story comes out in multiple interviews between the Jason Patrick interview the Lily Finney Zanuck interview she was the wife of uh, Richard Zanuck uh, part of Zanuck Brown who of course produced Jaws and just had incredible success she was his sort of much younger wife And I think Jason Patrick in his interview talks about being a little unsure about this project because he was like, I think it was mostly because he didn't feel like he was told 
their relationship or something like that. I may be misremembering that, but he basically talks about um, initially turning it down and then coming back to the material uh, or, or being interested in the material and coming back to it and meeting with Lily Finney Zanuck and finding her to be, you know, really intelligent and understood, just understood the material and, and they could work together. And so they did. Um, and it's a good interview. There's a 14, 25, 40 minute, 25 interview with, with Jason Patrick on here. That is a continuation of the previous interview. And, and it really, again, I love the way this stuff comes together. Uh, Jillian Horvat and Elijah Drenner worked on most of these features and in terms of editing and interviewing and, you know, um, you know, working with the, the directors on the commentaries and it just makes for a really great package. So I got to give them a hat, big hats off. I know that there are a few maybe featurettes they didn't do, but I, I think the lion's share is their work and they've done a really great job. And so I really want to, you know, s- sort of spotlight them and say, nice, nice work. Um, so anyway, the Lily F. Zanuck interview on here, she, this is her feature debut. And honestly, she didn't really do another feature. And she talks about why she didn't. She, it's about a 15 minute and 25 second interview. Uh, she goes into, you know, finding the material and casting and and this great story about how she and her husband ran into I think Victoria Principal at like an AMC they were coming out of a movie or going into a movie and whatever they were going to see she was like you got to go see After Dark my sweet and they were like oh really and so they went and saw it she said it was like a packed show they couldn't even sit together but both of them came out separately and were like that guy is the guy for this movie, you know, speaking of Jason Patrick in the film. And I love that idea that a single performance in a movie, you know, a matinee in LA can turn into another project. Um, that's just a neat story to me. Um, but it also shows how great that after dark, my sweet performance is. And, uh, so it's neat to have this, uh, Jason Patrick double within this and how the films talk to each other. Um, they talk to, uh, author Kim Wozencraft, who wrote the book this is based on, and it's based on her thesis for her Master of Fine Arts degree, and it talks about her personal experiences that went into the book. She was a cop, went undercover, had some problems with the drug. Like, it's not fully autobiographical necessarily, but there's a lot of stuff based on real stuff. Uh, and it's a, it's got a, the movie's got a great tension about it, as uh, Jason Patrick is looking for a new partner and uh, Sam Elliott helps him find Jennifer Jason Lee and initially they're unsure if she's the right one and they get involved and, and it just kind of starts to spiral and it's just, it's really powerful stuff. So it's a really solid movie. Uh, what else have we got here? Um, she's got an edge tour, a video essay by Chris O'Neill also narrated, uh, I believe by um, Claire Loy and uh, this one is talking about the low-key character drama about addiction and corruption. And I, it's tough for me to review the video essays. You know, um, it's like I, I don't review an essay that I've read necessarily. I can maybe give you some, some points that I took away from it. But ultimately, I feel like part of the problem with that is that it's there's something about the way that he's chosen the images that he's chosen and how they go with the essay portion as it's being read. And I just would rather you experience them. Just know that Chris O'Neill knows what he's doing and that you should watch his video essays. I, I think he does a good job with them. I think they're always good for we watch the movie and then you can kind of gather your thoughts afterward and while you're doing that, you're watching the video essay and I find it's a really nice exercise to sort of figure some things out. You're like, oh, okay, there's some connections I didn't make. It's still fresh in your head. It's like studying right before test or, but I don't want to make it sound academic. It's, it's cool. They're, they're cool and it's a good trend. I love seeing the video essays. Anyway, this is good. Next up we have another gem for me. This is Robert Benton's film Twilight from 1998. And, um, it is, the last great film, I think, for Gene Hackman. Uh, and it's it's a really good one for 
Paul Newman as well, who had just come off working with Benton in Nobody's Fool, which is great, and which is also coming, I believe, from imprint relatively soon. It's a really great character dramedy, uh, and this is too, but it's it's a film noir that's definitely a throwback. It's it's sort of self-aware, but it's also a throwback, and that might have been in the years following uh, Tarantino, Pulp Fiction, things like that, the more self-aware uh, postmodern crime films, this has that, but again, it's much more of a throwback, and it, it's much more akin to something like The Late Show, which is another great detective, older detective, older guy detective movie from 1978. One of my favorite movies, actually, with Art Carney and Lily Tomlin. And I think the two of these films go together well. This was called Geezer Noir by its critics at the time, and it wasn't that well received. Um, and I can see a few things that bothered critics, but ultimately, I don't get it. I, I really think this is a very solid film. It's got humor to it. It's got tension. You know, it's not just a comedy. Um, and I think that's one of the great things about The Late Show. That has more humor, but it also still has tension. And I think Robert Benton does a great job with that. Um, it's got a certain elegiac tone to it, you know, like sort of end of an era kind of stuff. Um, but I really dig it. It's the story of this sort of private detective guy who starts to go for, to work for a successful actor and his wife and their sort of symbiotic relationship and, and what the problems they get into, sort of what the roads those lead him down in terms of um, how he gets himself into Anyway, it's another one I don't want to talk about too much because I really feel like the mystery of it is the fun. And it was one of those movies when I watched it at the time, I was like, oh, this is, you know, even for me at the time, I was in college when it came out and I was working at a video store. I was like, oh, this looks like a movie for old people or something. I can't remember what I was thinking, but I ended up really liking it and I still do. And um, it's got an incredible cast. Obviously, you see Gene Hackman, Paul Newman, Sarah S Susan Sarandon, uh, James Garner, Stocker Channing, a very young Reese Witherspoon, Leif Schreiber, Giancarlo Esposito, Margot Martindale, M. Emmett Walsh. It goes on and on. Uh, so it's really solid stuff, and I definitely re recommend it. It has uh, audio commentary with film critics Alan Silver and James Orsini. They are a great pair of older gentlemen who immediately, you know, you let, let you know that they have seen a few movies. Like, they know what they're doing. They spot this thing that Newman does in the first scene that is most likely a definite nod to the big sleep that I totally missed in all the years I've watched this movie. And I was right, right away, I was like, okay, guys, I think you might know a few things about this that I don't or that I might have missed. And I'm right. And it's a great track. They're just conversing, but they have so many great contextual things they're talking about in terms of other films and about Benton and the actors. Wonderful track. Um, I mentioned Susan Sarandon is a descendant of the film, film fatales like Kathleen Turner and body heat, just all kinds of fun observations. Uh, the next commentary is from film critic slash podcasters, Alexi Tola Pollard. Oh boy. Uh, my, my Tolio Paulus. I am so sorry, Alexi, uh, and Blake Howard of one heat minute among other things. And these guys are great like just a great conversation about the film about you know scene specific things that they're grabbing onto and it's just one of those conversations that you're like oh yeah they're I mean it's different than the other one but they're bringing a lot of really interesting ideas to the table they've clearly watched the movie a few times before they've decided to do this but it's a very fun free-flowing conversation and I really enjoyed it it was a very nice track um, then you have Reflecting on Noir, uh, interview with Carol Littleton, about 15 minutes and 44 seconds, talks about, um, she talks about how she was discouraged to be an editor and to work, uh, in film by other female editors like Verna Fields and Dee Dee Allen, and it's a man's world, but she went ahead anyway, and so it's sort of an infor inspirational story about her getting into, uh, working on editing, you know, and how she met... She worked on films like The Mafu Cage and Body Heat uh, and met Robert Benton on The Late Show, although she didn't work on it. 
and she thinks of it now, this one, as a moving tribute to film noir, but also a farewell to the actors at the time. And she thinks The Big Sleep might be the biggest influence, which is a good sell, I think, ultimately. If you like The Big Sleep, you should watch this. Um, it's fun. Elmer's Twilight is an interview, 12 minutes and 40 seconds, with film music historian Daniel Schweiger. And he talks about Elmer Bernstein's score for Twilight, but also a general career overview, which is very interesting because I didn't know a lot about Bernstein's... I like him, but I just didn't know enough about his career. So it's really fun to hear that stuff. So that's Twilight. A couple more here. Um, this is another gem. Flesh and Bone. This is from uh, director Steve Clovis, who did The Fabulous Baker Boys. Uh, and this one, it's just another great cast. It's got Meg Ryan, Dennis Quaid, James Caan, Gwyneth Paltrow, um, those are the four big ones, but then there's some other folks, Scott Wilson, John Hawks in an early role. And it's, it's about like, it has this great opening sequence. I'm not even going to mess with, but 30 years after that, um, basically the Dennis Quaid character, who's the son of the James Conn character runs into, um, a woman who, who ties into the opening scene. I don't want to, I just don't want to spoil anything. Um, but it's just a fascinating character study. Um, in I want to say like rural Texas and Dennis Quaid's character is a guy who like has a vending machine business and he goes around to these vending machines and swaps things out. He's got one that's like, are you smarter than a chicken? Anyway, I don't want to, there's just about detail and about, the way the screenplay is constructed, it's like something I can't even describe. Like you just really have to watch this one because so much of it is, it is dialogue, but it's behavior and direction. And it's just a really solid film. And I bought it already on Blu-ray in the States. And I'm going to have to sell that now because this is by far the better release. The other one I got had nothing. This has tons of great features on it. Um, you know, so this, this one has, maybe my favorite commentary in the whole set. And that is with uh, Steve Clovis, moderated by, again by Jillian Horvat, uh, who does just a fantastic job here um, in, in facilitating. He's kind of a quieter guy, and I feel like you know he would have had some good comments, but she really brings out uh, a great conversation about his creative process, about writing, acting, balancing tone, it's just a great chat that you're like, wow, that's, and she has so many thoughtful uh, insights that really trigger things for him. And I just loved it. I thought it was one of the standout commentaries in the set. Uh, it also has uh, a tradition of tragedies an interview with editor Mia Goldman, who also talks about Dee Dee Allen. Her father was Bo Goldman, the screenwriter. Uh, she talks about getting work with Carol Littleton to help on a movie, which helped her get into the guild and then really enjoyed hearing her stories about breaking into the business in general and how tricky it can be for a woman and also speaks to her process on Flesh and Bone, which is great. Uh, All About Place, an interview with production designer John Hutman, that's 14 minutes, 43 seconds, talks about finding his way into the job. There's a lot of that in these interviews. Uh, his first movie was Heather's, and he got the job uh, on this movie because of the work he did on A River Runs Through It, the uh, Robert Redford film mentions that Steve Clovis always drove a blue Toyota pickup truck and that he's a very serious, grounded, thoughtful guy and goes into detail about the production. But one of the big takeaways is that they did try to design the film in a way to make it timeless. And they did a lot of locations and you can feel it. You can feel that it's not a set bound movie, that it's, it's got this character to the design, you know, that just really, it's a great movie guys. I gotta, I gotta highly recommend this one. It's like a cult item in some ways. Really good stuff. Okay, and then last, but not least, maybe my you know least favorite movie in the set, but but a fascinating one nonetheless, uh, and that is Mortal Thoughts. And this movie is from 1991, ultimately directed by uh, Alan Rudolph. But part of the fun of this one, and it's the story of basically a let's see a guy ends up dead it's trying to figure out like who's to blame for the murder and 
it's <laughs> he's not a great guy uh and it's sort of about the the folks trying to solve this murder um but there's a lot of bad people in the uh, it's hard to explain like <laughs> it's a really interesting movie uh, ultimately, maybe not successful, but interesting nonetheless. Uh, great cast: Demi Moore, Glenn Headley, Bruce Willis, John Pankow, Harvey Keitel, Frank Vincent. Uh, it's it's got a deep bench to it. Um, and but I, I gotta say, outside of the movie, the one of the reasons that this stuff can be fun is that hearing the stories about the movie are even more interesting, maybe than the movie itself. And you got a lot of great interviews here. You've got, um, let's see, you've got a commentary by film scholar Adrian Martin to start with, which definitely helps. Uh, Murder Most Foul, an interview with executive producer Taylor Hackford, who is a guy that I like very much as a filmmaker and as a producer. And he talks about his history. And he doesn't really pull punches. Like he talks about movies that studios didn't want to make and how he decided to get into producing because of that, and it's it's really good. But then he also talks about this movie in particular and how, through his company, he was developing it, and he got a short film from the original director that sort of sold him a bill of goods that this guy would be the guy to do it, and then it wasn't the case. I, I really would like you guys to hear the way he tells the story, uh, but ultimately, they had to replace the director. They get Alan Rudolph... But it's really interesting. to hear, You hear about this stuff all the time. Some director replaces another director. You don't always hear the behind the scenes, the why. But the story about this is really fun and really interesting. So that's a great interview. And as interesting, maybe more, is this interview with... Um, it's called Trouble Dreams, The Art and Style of Mortal Thoughts, an interview with production designer Howard Cummings and art director Bob Shaw, about 20, 21 and a half minutes long. And they go into their experience on the movie and that's fascinating because, you know, they had a certain idea of what they were supposed to be doing and then uh, Alan Rudolph came on board and he's, there's one point where Howard Cummings tells this great story about one sentence that Alan Rudolph says to him that just completely changes everything they've been doing. Throws everything off. Uh, he's also got some great stories about putting together sets and taking a like a police station set where they had filled the room with desks, and then Alan Rudolph keeps coming back and saying mm, less, less until they're like they have one desk, and then they have like he's like you need some glass dividers or something, and they find some stuff, and I love that they show you the scene, and you're like, and he's like, we found these glass dividers just laying around. This shows you the great work that a production designer can do with like nothing, you know, with scraps, in a way that you would never know if somebody didn't tell you, especially when you set up a certain contextual thing about the movie as a whole. Uh, so anyway, that's a great interview with both of them. Really good stuff. Uh, and then there is an interview with uh, composer Mark Isham. Fatal flashback, scoring moral thoughts, about 16 minutes. You know, I didn't realize that he had, I know Isham just because he's become a big composer, but I didn't realize he had sort of a relationship with Alan Rudolph, that he had seen Choose Me and decided he wanted to work with Rudolph. Well, serendipitously, Rudolph had gotten one of his albums and gone through his management to try and find out if Aisham was composing films. And and so they sort of met in the middle and he did uh, Trouble in Mind for him and then this movie. And so they have this relationship I didn't know, of, I know about and I liked hearing about that. So anyway, there's so much stuff in the set, you guys. And I haven't even talked about this. You get this whole book. It's not a booklet. This is like a mini book, right? Um, and it... Uh, let's see here if they even... I mean, there's just so much happening on the back. This is just a summation of what, what I've just told you, basically. Um, but you've got uh, essays by Walter Chow and I mean they're, they're, almost all the movies have their own kind of entry in here so this is like a whole other thing I mean this is really high quality stuff I've talked about this on the channel before and you know these boutique labels are really really digging deep and producing wonderful releases now this set is not cheap 
that's part of the reason I've taken the time to go through everything that you get. So you understand when you see that price point, it's going to be a bit of a sticker shock for you. Uh, I think I saw it for about 150 on uh, deep discount or import CDs. Um, these are non-region locked. This is all, these played all played fine in my region A player, and so you don't have to worry about being region free to get these. Uh, but just know that this is a high quality set. This is you know on par with the the best Criterion box sets. You know this is really really good stuff and a good selection of films. A lot of little gems. And I'm looking forward to see what the next one is. I, I just thought they really knocked it out of the park, and they have been for this entire year. And there's still more great stuff coming. There, I think there's an Essential Noir set coming. There are some other individual releases that I'm excited about from them. They're just doing great work. Uh, so I'm going to try and keep highlighting them as much as I can, but know that uh, they are worth your time. And if you haven't started with them, think about it, because... Um, this is like, this is quite an epic thing right here. If you're into noir, neo-noir, this will be up your alley. So anyway, that'll do it for this episode. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.